Oh, I can't, is this one? Oh, yes. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the second session of Deep Sea Research. And as you know, we, um, there is a mistake in the program we just noticed, but I think most of the people knew that it started at 4 and not at 4.30 this session. It has been always announced as 4, but there is a mistake in one of the pages where I say it's 4.30, but I think everyone is here. So, uh, first of all, welcome to all of you. And one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm going just to give a brief overview of what we are talking about in this session, because in this session we are going to address quite a few number of topics, which I think are highly relevant for the Mediterranean, but they are also highly relevant to the Atlantic, and they are highly relevant globally. So one of the things that we would like with this meeting in particular is that we start to explore how we can better uh, make a connection between what we are doing in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. I myself have been doing both cruises in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic for some years, but uh, uh, there are many, many issues which are really common to all of us. And so I think there's plenty that we can do together. And I think CSM has a great role to do on this. But of course, this is not something that we can do from above. It's something that it has to come from all of us as researchers that we strengthen uh, the way we cooperate. So basically, one of the things that we are going to deal uh, is with the, the questions related to habitat mapping. So this is crucial, and particularly because now when we start thinking about protecting a large part of the ocean and doing some work like we have been just doing in Portugal, uh, a large group was working, a uh, multidisciplinary group, doing our, our marine protected areas definition with the Ministry of the Sea, which has just been published very recently. And so it's crucial that we look at the new data that we have. Normally, we use uh, remote sensing data like multi-beam bathymetry, backscatter, and so on. But when we complement it with high resolution images, many things are coming up. And so there's, there's a point now where on which we need to think how we should go about it, how we can do automatic classification schemes, how we can com combine them with in situ observations, with ROV observations, even with AUV, with uh, highly stable AUVs. So there's plenty that we can do, and there are many things that we are learning, and probably uh, there will be a need even to reclassify some of the things that we have in UNIS and other classification schemes. So this is something that we'll be addressing, and I'm hoping we will have um, interventions from everyone concerning this topic. Uh, one of the things concerning these, these habitats, for instance, just one other thing highlighting the common things we have. I'm, I'm drawing your attention to one of the habitats to which I've been working for a long time, which is the, the fact that um, we have uh, m m mud volcanoes and areas where we have methane seepage. And so we have them in the Mediterranean, all over the Eastern Mediterranean. We have it in the West Mediterranean. We have in Cadiz. We have in the South Portuguese margin. So these are from the South Portuguese margin. This is the Ionian, the Madonna of the Ionian, who Sylvia knows very well. And so, and these are all the mud volcanoes that we've been working not only offshore uh, South Iberia, but also in, um, in the Auburn Sea. So all the systems are connected and they are, really interesting because not only from the point of view of uh, the, the mechanics of the system, so the tectonics, the fluid escape structures, but also from the habitats and from the typical, e typical extreme ecosystems that we find where most of the cruises we find new species for, for science. So this is a highly interesting topic and of course the connections between Mediterranean and Atlantic are obvious. The other thing that we'll be talking about is thermal line circulation. As you know, it's one of the main processes to, to spread the, the temperature and salinity in the world ocean. And so it's really fundamental that we understand what's going on. And this goes from the molecular level to macro scale. So looking at the different scales in uh, processes from uh, double diffusion processes and salt fingering uh, down, which are even at the molecular level, and then going into eddies and how they form and so on. So the, the area of the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean outflow and the Atlantic inflow into this area are areas crucial to understand uh, thermal line circulation. And so it's really important 
that we have uh, new observations on this, and particularly as we will be see, we will have two, two talks on this topic. It's really important that we have repeated observations and that we combine shipborne observations with remote sensing data, and also now with the new Argos, where we can extend not only temperature and salinity to, to the biogeochemical sensors. So there's plenty that we can do, and I'm hoping that within CESM we can increase this. So now, as we can see, we can have very highly detailed images of eddies. These are used with seismics, and we can invert them for temperature and salinity, and so you can get really high-resolution images of temperature and salinity inside an eddy. So these are many of the developments that we can have in this topic. One other thing that we will, we will be addressing, but uh, uh, we can discuss it here. Uh, unfortunately, Chaza cannot come, but uh, this is a work with, uh, with some other colleagues with whom we've been working for a while. And the tectonics of the, of the Mediterranean is, of course, highly complex. And one of the things that we still miss is a highly detailed magnetic chart. Because to properly understand how the different um, openings uh, were happening along the whole basin and the subduction zones and so on, it's absolutely critical that we have a good uh, map. And in this work, which we will not be seeing, uh, unfortunately, uh, there is a tentative to include not only uh, magnetics, but seismic, and put together seismic stratigraphy interpretation together with magnetics to better understand uh, some, particularly some of the triangular um, openings that we can see. One other thing that we'll be looking at is how do you have, how do you sustain what is acting as a hard ground for coral reefs? And so, as before, we used to think that you need uh, very strong hard ground and so on, but now we know they can fix in very small things. And here we will be looking at um, uh, possibilities like barnacles and so on, where you can have these systems. And we, we have lots of these systems, again, in the Gulf of Cadiz, so in the part of the Atlantic, which continue into the Mediterranean. So again, another topic for discussion. And of course, looking at the geochemistry and the physical parameters in the water layer is essential. And we, we will be looking at images uh, that are being uh, taken in the Mediterranean region, but also going to the Atlantic, as far as I remember from Tosti, Tosti's uh, presentation in the session before. And so this is crucial, particularly because it's uh, something that CIESM has done which is promoting uh, repetition in observations. And so we need long time series to understand these things. So uh, this is all I have to say. So I wish you a, a great session and I would like to invite the first speaker who is um, Ana Lucia Cantafaro. Yes, please. Recent ROV surveys have led to the discovery of uh, deep sea, uh, new deep sea habitats in the Malta Fisheries Management Zone at depths of uh, 200 to 1,000 meters. Uh, we attempted to classify uh, these um, new uh, deep sea habitat types according to the uh, existing habitat classification schemes, but found these to be insufficient. For instance, for deep sea uh, rocky bottoms, uh, the uni scheme shown at the, the top only includes the general category uh, deep sea bedrock and only one kind of uh, um, cold water coral habitat, deep sea uh, Lophelia pertusa reefs. Uh, the recently updated REXPA scheme um, is slightly, is, is slightly more detailed, but we observed uh, um, new habitat types which are, not, uh, which are not included in this scheme. Um, here we have uh, some examples of new deep sea habitat types uh, observed uh, in Maltese water so far because it's, it is still a work in progress, so there may be others, uh, not yet included in the existing schemes. Uh, in some cases, um, the new habitat types are uh, mixed, mixed assemblages. 
uh, for instance, the uh, Gorgonian Callogorgia verticillata um, and the Black Cora Leopates glaberima um, co-occurring together at similar abundance. Um, React um, existing schemes uh, uh, include uh, uh, phases with uh, uh, alchonacea or phases with uh, antipataria, but treat these uh, as two separate habitats. Other habitats are uh, uh, essentially entirely new. Uh, for instance, we observed for uh, deep sea soft bottoms uh, the hydrozoan Lithocarpia mirophyllum. Um, while uh, no faces with uh, hydrozoan is included in the in, uh, existing schemes. Here we have two examples of uh, new deep sea uh, soft bottom uh, habitat types, batial sediment with uh, pelosine arborescence and burrowing fauna, and batial sediment with pelosine arborescence and stilocordia pellita. In both cases, uh, the large foraminifera uh, is dominant. Here we have uh, two examples of uh, uh, new hard bottom uh, deep sea habitat types. Uh, the first is an example of uh, two species commonly found together in Maltese waters, but for which there is no equivalent in existing schemes. And uh, uh, the second is a, an example of, uh, um, uh, of um, a situation where uh, existing schemes uh, refers to, for example, scleractinia, uh, faces with scleractinia, or faces with uh, um, antipataria, or faces with sponges, but as three distinct faces. Um, whereas uh, we observed uh, um, the, uh, the, these dominant species co-occurring together. So considering the variety of uh, additional mixed assemblages uh, uh, discovered from Maltese waters, existing schemes may however need to be uh, revised in order to avoid uh, excessively cumbersome classification systems. For instance, uh, habitat with more than one dominant species uh, could then be uh, simply classified as areas with uh, uh, a mixture of uh, two phases or uh, assemblage types. Thank you. So now the next speaker will be Vanessa. Yes. Cardin? Yes. Perfect. Okay, good afternoon everybody. We talk about the thermal line circulation during the Trans-Mediterranean uh, 2002 Ghost Ship Cruise. Uh, this is just preliminary uh, results. And I have with my colleagues uh, uh, from uh, OGS and also from HCMR and uh, from University of Hamburg. So just a brief review for those who are not uh, familiar, but I think most of you have because we are here in the Mediterranean uh, Congress. So the Mediterranean Sea is a miniature ocean. It's called also miniature ocean because it has a, the most relevant, relevant uh, processes that are also in the global uh, ocean. It has a very high variability in circulation that is mainly uh, driven by internal external forcings. We, it is characterized by a different scale as uh, the circulation is, dif is characterized by different scales and gyres uh, as we can see here. And uh, it is also uh, characterized by being having the uh, uh, deep formation sites, one in Adriatic Sea and one in the Northwestern Mediterranean. And it's also finally as a um, uh, characteristics is influenced by North, uh, North uh, Ionian Jar that is uh, very relevant for the distribution of our salinity in the whole uh, basin. During the past years, there have been a brook, uh, a brook the changes uh, in both basins and the Eastern Mediterranean. We have had the Eastern Mediterranean transient that has been the shifting from the Adriatic uh, deep water formation uh, side to the Aegean. 
while in the Western Mediterranean there was a very unusual uh, deep uh, convection, uh, convection that formed water, very warm and salty, that filled the, uh, the deep uh, part of the Western Mediterranean. So the cruise during, during the uh, March, April 2018, we had the uh, trans transnational and transmet uh, cruise uh, on board the research vessel, uh, uh, German research vessel, uh, Maria Civil Marian, and uh, which um, perform uh, trans uh, tra as east-west, okay, here, an east-west, an east-west transect, also almost zonal, repeating some uh, transects already uh, historical in order to get more information about the changes that had been occurring in, 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 in the years. We also had a, a, a transect north-south that had been done also during the cruise of 2011. The, um, this is, uh, the cruise was done in the framework of the Ghost Sheet program Data are uh, delivered to Bangea, and uh, it's a long-time international collaboration. The aim of the the aim of the cruise was to give more knowledge uh, uh, to the variability to trends uh, uh, taking place in the Mediterranean Sea. It was in the, either in the hydrography, in circulation, and also a biochemical parameters. There were several uh, different ways to measure. We had pe pe parameters, physical, chemical. We also have Argo floats and the use of the UCTT data. So this has been the pre preliminary results. Uh, uh, there are, we can see if we compare from the data that we had from 2011 uh, cruise, there are some difference, uh, but it seems that it's going to the, the, the system, they say the Mediterranean Sea is going to the, toward the uh, pre-M situation, but in very, very slowly. And, uh, but we have three main uh, facts uh, in this case. We have uh, uh, the entrance of the, here, we have the entrance and uh, where the spreading of the Atlantic water into the, into the eastern Mediterranean Sea that is in accordance with the cyclonic phase that is now from the North, uh, North Ionian Gyre. Um, but uh, there is a little bit different from the situation that was in 2011, that in that time was uh, changing from anticyclonic to cyclonic phase. Another thing, uh, this make a uh, 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 Suppose in the restricting water going to high salinity water, either to the Levantine basin, as no was in the here in the um, western in the eastern flank of the Ionian towards the Adriatic, the Adriatic Sea. Another special, another issue that have been found in this preliminary research is the score of a uh, high salinity water entering to the. Made, uh, Western Mediterranean, I forgot to say, this is, this is here, the Eastern Mediterranean, we have divided, this is the Western Mediterranean, and this part was not, uh, was not um, simply because of uh, problems, political problems. And finally, we have this, uh, we have seen a salinif salinification that was already reported in some previous, uh, already published, um, uh, uh, papers uh, as further in 2016. As a second uh, preliminary uh, result, as we have a comparison with the data that uh, ha was in a in deep study from uh, Cardinet in 2015 that analy analyzed uh, the data from 87 to 2010, uh, 2011. From uh, from cruise in in uh, data from a cruise in two in two in two air in two areas. Uh, in this work, we are updating the data uh, uh, to get the knowledge up to now what is occurring for 2015 and 2018. As we can see here, we are in the we have the intermediate uh, the intermediate layer that is reflecting the um, influence of the Ionian gyre. When it is an anticyclonic, uh, anticyclonic phase, we have a more, um, 
more saline water enter into the Levantine, into the Levantine while now uh, it is a reversal going to uh, this is the entrance of the uh, low salinity water and uh, with a regression of the salinity in either in the central Ionian as for uh, in the in the in the eastern Levant time, there is a time uh, time lag uh, more or less between the three to se to seven ten years that it was already published by Gatchis et al in 2013. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So hi, uh, my name is uh, Tal Ozer. I work in the Israeli Oceanographic and Limnological Research uh, <laughs> Institute. And I'll uh, try and give you a brief uh, overview of uh, recent uh, research we have just published dealing with the uh, thermoaline variability and dynamics of the deep water of the southeastern Levantine Basin. Um, so of course the, the stage setting, if you want, for this research is the East Mediterranean transients, which I'm sure you uh, all know as the deep water or the intensive deep water formation uh, that happened in the, uh, took place in the Aegean from the end of the 80s until the mid 90s of the previous <coughs> century. And of course this, um, this change or this anomaly was uh, uh, also uh, uh, arrived in uh, the southeastern uh, Mediterranean Sea where it was first observed in 1995 on a meteor cruise as you can see on the TS diagram to your left, so um, what am I pressing here? This one? Yeah, so the first inverse hook you can see here, okay, and uh, gradually becoming more and more prominent, and it seems to seem to stabilize around the end of the first decade of the new millennia. So then uh, our research tried to look at the next decade, that is uh, uh, eight years uh, of data spanning 2012 to 2019. We used 23 cruises conducted uh, by IOLR. The majority of these are the Haifa section uh, cruises, which are performed biannually, together with several additional uh, um, campaigns. So on your uh, left, sorry, that's the one. On your left, you can see maps that originated from an extended background survey which we completed in 2013, uh, which covered uh, all of the Israeli EEZ zone, or EEZ waters, and that enabled us to basically map for the first time the spatial distribution of the EMT uh, anomaly. Uh, so what you see are values of potential temperatures and salinity close to the bottom. And not surprisingly, we can see that this spreading is bounded by the bathymetry, okay, so up to around uh, uh, 1,500 meters or so. Uh, that's where the spreading stops. So now, next, let's look at the time series originating, again, from the same Haifa section cruises covering the same uh, spanning of years, and I'm using here the deepest station, age 06 of Haifa section, and I want to bring your attention to the minimum salinity zone at around 1,000 uh, decibel level. Um, and as you can see, uh, over the majority or, or most of our data set, we have recognized that there is a salinity rise in this level uh, as uh, salinity rises until around, let's say, mid-2017, and then it seems to stabilize uh, uh, for the remainder, remainder of our uh, data set. Um, below, uh, this, is, this is data or average data of the same level, the 1,000 mit, uh, meter or decibels level, of all three deep stations of Haifa section. And you can see that this finding is consistent. It's there in all three stations, but it seems to be more prominent or more clear in the deeper stations. Um, next, plotting the same set of data as a TS diagram. And here we color coded the profiles on, uh, by years. Okay, so you can see the scale of years running from 2012 to 2019. So once again, it's very easy to see this minimum salinity zone, yeah, the actual salinification and some warming uh, taking place uh, over the years until a stable 
stages uh, er we arrive at around 2017. But another interesting result we found here was the, the, um, um, the appearance of apparently newly, new, relatively, let's say, uh, for relatively newly formed uh, deep water from Adriatic origin. Now, the return of the Adriatic as a source of deep water has been long ago uh, uh, established, and it's been found as, as, as early as 2001 in the Ionian. But in our waters, so this is a, a um, campaign which we, uh, which we did in 2012. And as you can see, we see the inverse hook here in deeper stations, in stations which are deeper than 2,000 meters, and only as east as... Uh, uh, as Cyprus, not beyond that. And here is a, an, in this insert is a zoom on a profile which we did in March 2018, and it's the first appearance of these waters closer to, um, to the Israeli shore or to the continent, uh, continental slope. So uh, obviously time limits me, so I will not go much deeper into uh, uh, our results. I will just uh, mention that first of all, we were able to identify uh, vertical diffusion as the major actor in this uh, salinification trend. And we were able to identify that this salinification and warming is actually coming from the shallower uh, water uh, levels, so from the intermediate levels, and this has already been published and known. So we gradually see this signal coming into deeper and deeper water. And, and additionally, we were able to link this appearance of the, the newly formed uh, deep water from Adriatic origin with a slight signal or a very um, um, a small signal, but it's still there of some heaving, some uplift uh, uh, using the isobars anomalies, uh, the composition following Bindoff and McDougall. And of course, I invite you to come and visit our poster when we can go in much more detail. Thank you. We have Christina Pisani. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Christina, and I shall be discussing the contribution of barnacles to biogenic reef formation in the deep waters around Malta. So our study is based off of previous work that was conducted by Angeletti and his co-workers, who suggested that barnacles contribute significantly to habitats which are dominated by cold water corals. And the extent of that contribution was the focus of our study. To do that, um, ROV footage that was collected by Live Bahar for N2K in the summers of 2015 and 16 was analyzed. The scope of this footage was to record the deep sea bentos around the Maltese waters to establish new protected areas, which have actually been established at this point. Now, whilst the uh, footage for the entire project was around the entire Maltese islands, uh, our focus was studied on the east escarpment of the Malta Graben, which is on the west side of Malta. And uh, the footage that was collected ranged from depths of 200 to 1,000 meters, and whilst all the barnacles were included in the study, Pachylas magiganteum was by far the most dominant species present. So our results showed that in habitats where cold water coral density was quite high, barnacles tended to occur at low density. And this accounted for approximately 18% of the total barnacles recorded. Conversely, when cold water corals tended to be sparse, barnacles thrived much more, and this accounted for approximately 78% of the total barnacles collected. So these two principal observations accounted for 96% of the total barnacles recorded. The remaining 4% were recorded in habitats, or rather the 4% were recorded still with barnacles at low density in habitats also with low co cold water coral density, However, in such habitats, there were other habitat-forming species, such as sponges, present. So, our main conclusions were that barnacle contribution to biogenic reef formation was still minor compared to anthozoans, however, only when the two species are present simultaneously. 
in the absence of cold water corals, barnacles were actually an important biogenic substratum former. However, at the end of it all, um, there was no evidence of barnacle accretion or that they are able to grow in layers to form physically complex structures and extensive frameworks. And that's it from me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And now it's Catherine Schroeder. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Katrin Schröder. I work uh, as a physical oceanographer at CNR Ismar in Venice. And my poster is about the physical and biogeochemical properties that we measured along a uh, north-south uh, repeated transect in the Western Mediterranean in 2006. So in this map, you can see uh, the, the, uh, cruise, uh, the station position that we covered in during the, uh, that cruise in the framework of uh, MedShip program, which I will explain now. So MedShip is uh, the Mediterranean component of the global Go ship uh, um, program, which is a program, uh, uh, decadal program about uh, repeated hydrography over the, uh, the whole uh, global ocean. And the Mediterranean uh, science community decided that it was time to include the Mediterranean into this global effort. So we succeeded to, to include the east-west transect, which uh, Vanessa told us about, uh, into the global program. So this is actually officially part of the global go ship program. And then uh, we also considered it important to maintain a repetition on uh, uh, almost decadal scale of north-south sections, two in the western Mediterranean and two in the eastern Mediterranean. So in 2016, thanks to ship time offered by the Eurofleet project, we were able to cover uh, both basin. So uh, in this presentation, I'm just talking about the western Mediterranean uh, um, transect, but in the same year, 2016, also the eastern Mediter Mediterranean uh, midship transects have been covered. So um, we hope to make a uh, next repetition of these north-south uh, transects, uh, maybe in 2021. We have asked for ship time for this, and we hope that we will get it. So the prim primary objectives for MedShip, as for GoShip, is to observe long-term changes in physical and biogeochemical properties, including uh, also carbonate um, system parameters, and to observe changes in the thermal line circulation in general. And uh, also, uh, I have to mention that uh, MedShip is actually a CSM initiative because it first uh, started thanks to a workshop, uh, workshop in 2011, I think, uh, funded by CSM to, to make this program up. So in this particular cruise, 2016, we uh, measured uh, over 43 CTD stations along the two north-south transects plus an additional transect, uh, uh, CTD uh, data, biogeochemical data like uh, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, carbonate system, barium, oxygen, and isotopes of um, nitrogen, plus anthropogenic uh, traces like CFC and SF6. So here I just show a few examples of what we found. This on the left is the Algeria Provencal transect. On the right, you have the Tyrrhenian transect. Uh, we have salinity in this plot and oxygen. So briefly, we can see the direct inflow of Atlantic water uh, in the southern part of the Algeria Provencal basin with its low sal salinity signature. Uh, what we can see in the Tyrrhenian is, for instance, in the southern part of the Tyrrhenian, the entrance of the salty and low uh, oxygenated intermediate water coming directly from the eastern Mediterranean. And on the other part of the transect, as well as in the southern part of the Algeria Provencal Basin, we can see the, uh, um, the uh, less, even less oxygenated and a bit uh, less saltier intermediate water after it has become uh, older crossing the, the Mediterranean Sea. To show you in a further example, this time on biogeochemical properties, these are average uh, profiles of uh, the ratio between nitro, uh, nitrate and phosphates, 
phosphate. So here you have pressure. And uh, we have the Algera Provencal data in gray and the Tyrrhenian data in, uh, in black. And uh, this is just to show you the, the striking difference that we have between these two environments. We have uh, an average below 150 meter depth. We have an average uh, NP ratio, which is called also the red free ratio, which is 19.4 in the Algera Provencal Basin. The classical red free ratio in the ocean is about 16. Uh, and in the Tyrrhenian Sea, we have a much higher red free ratio, uh, NP ratio of 21.6. So what can this tell us about the two environments, for instance, that the uh, oligotrophy in the Tyrrhenian is much higher than in the rest of the uh, Western Mediterranean, and it is um, phosphorus limited compared to the Algero Provencal uh, basin. So I just want to invite you to see the poster if you want to see mo more data on this cruise and also if you want to know more on the MedShip uh, program. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the speakers for the excellent talks and I'm sure there will be some questions from the audience. And one wanted to start, Fatima. the characterization in terms of uh, physical and chemical properties in the water column in the Mediterranean. I wonder how difficult would it be to add to your program the biological part of it? I mean, adding a sampling of uh, microorganisms in the water column, the uh, sediments in, in the bottom, and looking into the microfossils as well because we have been heard as well about the need for a baseline. And if we want to really have a baseline that is not being affected by human or uh, warm climate impact, then we sh need to go back in time and go to preview data beyond 1850 at least. So would it be possible to have that component? I, I, I'm looking at you because you were the first one. She's looking at Toste, but I think this is for you. You are the co well, Toste is actually the more, in, more indicated uh, than me to answer this question, but uh, because he's uh, involved in the actually uh, ghost ship program, so we, are, we have just invested the Mediterranean into an existing program. I think there is a dis mm, distinction between different parameters uh, in, in GoShip, you have uh, level one parameters, level two parameters, level three, and maybe in level three, uh, they are now entering more biological measurements. For instance, f uh, for the quiz that we asked for in 2021, we have uh, some kind of biological measurements included, which are uh, still like automatic uh, measurements, like uh, the underwater video Profiler to, to measure some sort of zooplankton. I am I'm not a biologist, sorry. <laughs> so maybe you can add something. It, it's a great question, and it kind of reports back to what I asked in the previous session. Um, at the Go Ship Steering Committee meeting in Honolulu three weeks ago, we had a great presentation by Emmanuel Boss, and he presented a number of bio variables, bio-optics and so on, that we think that we could actually do very successful on GoShip. So this is a very active discussion. And underwater vision profile is one of them. There are other things that we can do in the water column. I see it very difficult to go down and take sediment samples on GoShip cruises. That is just going to take a lot of time. Most of the GoShip cruises are you know, crossing basins of Pacific and Atlantic. So sediment is difficult, but I think you know this is a call for bio community to see how what is feasible and what is responding to the essential ocean variables of the global ocean observing system, uh, what can we do? So I think this is a conversation we need to have and you know, since a biogeochemist and Katrin is a physicist, we need your input on that. But we are willing to and we are reaching out to the biology community and see what we can do together. Uh, just before we go ahead, just one question. Uh, from what I saw there in, in the, and also I saw in the previous presentation that you made in the previous panel, uh, you, you did some measurements also in the Atlantic, in the part of the Gulf of Cadiz. So how do you see both of you 
you're very welcome to answer both of you. What is the way how to, how can, what can we take advantage to make measurements both in the part of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic? And particularly looking at both the Mediterranean outflow and the Atlantic inflow. So maybe do you want to start? Actually, of course, it's very useful to make the, the transect full. I mean, not stopping at Gibraltar, but going out. And uh, because you, you really need to know what is going into the Mediterranean to understand what is happening in the Mediterranean. Because, for instance, there were some discussion about why the salinity of the Mediterranean is increasing. And one possible explanation was that actually it was not, not only increased evaporation or decreased the river input, but it was more salty Atlantic water coming in. So it's really important to have this uh, clear picture also outside Gibraltar. Can, can I respond also? Um, is it very important to have data from the Atlantic, but the thing is to get the real picture from the, Adria, from the Mediterranean Sea is to have the <coughs> Eastern Mediterranean, really the Levantine basin <coughs> the, to cover, be covered. And I think uh, one of the main issues is to try to solve these political issues that uh, allowed scientists to go and sample it because in some places we are missing, and also in our analysis, I have to go through taking data from uh, maybe from all the cruises that are more or less uh, in the time, but they can help to analyze or to get the answer to some questions that we have. But if we don't have the complete transect, uh, there will be a really problem to get the real picture. Anyone want to comment on this? Uh, I think this is really a critical issue, which happens in many parts of the world. But of course, in the Mediterranean, it's important. And it's crucial, I would say. But uh, again, I think maybe CSM could have a role on this in trying uh, to convince people uh, of the importance uh, of, of having observations in these places and what people can gain from this. For instance, one of the things I'll be mentioning tomorrow, for instance, the question of bathymetry, where we miss a lot of data, particularly in the shallow water. This is absolutely fundamental to model tsunami and for geohazard. And we miss that data. And that data, if it is shared, we can do that. The same thing has to do with sharing data concerning these observations. So I think we have the decade of ocean science uh, for sustainable development starting in 2021. I'm also at the IOC. And I think this is a great opportunity where we can try to put all these different delegations together and make sure that we are able to sort some of these problems. Sometimes it's really very difficult, as many of us know, but uh, we also need to make sure that people really understand the benefit they get. And don't think that this is a benefit we are getting, some other countries are getting. So this is, has to do with capacity building, has to do with making uh, some of these countries able also to do modeling so that they understand the importance of the data, getting them really involved. And I think in that sense, maybe we still have a way to go. I don't know if anyone wants to comment. Please, Tosta. So, uh, maybe I comment on your question, uh, comment. I think it really makes sense to, to extend that go ship section across the Strait of Gibraltar into the Gulf of Cadiz. That being said, the, the variability in the strait itself is such high, so you only like rely on different observing systems, mooring, some time series stations. Mm -hmm. But the trick is to combine this to get the full picture. So GoShip is focusing on the interior of the main basins, but it makes sense to, to cover the Gulf of Cadiz and make that connection to the, to the Atlantic. Sure. Of course, we also have the Argo floats, and particularly the new Argo systems with the biogeochemical sensors. So the previous uh, Argo systems, as most of the people know, we have a large coverage of 3,600 or 700 buoys, and the other ones I think we have something like 300. It's one order of magnitude less. And so this is something where I think in the Mediterranean, and again, CIASM could have a role in making sure that people understand the importance and the different countries are able to contribute uh, with the new boys. And actually at IOC we were able to, to sort out the problems, the political problems, because these boys drift. So in a way we are dealing with a similar problem. And at IOC we were able to get the set of parameters that we can measure 
and we were able to sort out the political problems. Okay, in some cases, the country may say, okay, you just switch it off because it will drift into my area. But in many cases, these things are being solved. But please, I would like to have some more questions to the other speakers, please. Or to the same, very welcome. Silvia. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment to what you said, which I found very important about the, the importance of bathymetry in shallow water. I think this is key for a lot of disciplines, for marine geozard, for submerged archaeology, and, and, and it's time consuming. This is the problem of, of bathymetry in shallow water, whereas in deep water it's faster, in shallow water it takes a lot of time. So it's time consuming, it, it's expensive, and for this there is a need of a strategy, of, of a long-term strategy for acquiring data in shallow water and maybe repeated data of the same bathymetry, which is very time, even more time consuming. So I, th I hope this issue will be considered also as a possibility here in CSM. Thank you. Yes, I would just add to that that, uh, uh, of course, it's very time consuming, very expensive. But sometimes even some countries, they have the data and they don't release the data. Okay? Uh, but the thing is, uh, if you release the data, even with degrading its, its resolution, it's still much better than what we have. And at the same time, what people need to realize is that the Mediterranean and, of course, the South Iberia, we have huge problems with, uh, with geohazards, particularly with the tsunami hazard. And so we, we need to work together. And if we don't have this shallow water bathymetry, we cannot properly model the run-ups and everything connected with the tsunamis. And so we're in trouble. So. I think that's something that we all need to do. And since in CSM we have people from all these countries, I think this is something that we need to bring home and see how we can make things progress. Please, any other questions? I think no one has yet mentioned the things uh, about, Analushi was talking about habitat mapping and uh, the importance of whether we need to revise the classification schemes like UNIS and others, and what is the importance of new methods, what are they bringing in. I don't know, since we have some more time, even if you want to elaborate on this, you're very welcome, because you were a bit short of time, but anyone else would like to comment on this issue? Hmm. Would you like to make some extra comments? <laughs> We, we just realized when we were doing um, a marine protected areas plan for Portugal, which we just released very recently, uh, we had lots of problems because there are, particularly for deep sea, um, not all the classification schemes are still very adapted. And so we found out that there were things that we need to change. But maybe you can elaborate on this or anyone else? Okay. Um, yes, for sure, it's, uh, it will be um, important to, to, to define, to redefine this uh, habitat classification scheme in order also to, to draft, uh, for example, monitoring and management plans for uh, um, future marine protected areas. There are already a couple of, uh, of marine protected areas in the deep sea, but uh, considering uh, uh, the vari variety of uh, cold water coral province, uh, not only in Malta, in the deep sea around Maltese Island, but also, for example, in front of uh, Santa Maria di Leuca in uh, uh, Puglia, south of Italy, or Sardinia coast, co in the deep sea, uh, around uh, Sar Sardinia Island, or uh, also France and uh, Spain. Uh, this is something that so needs to be uh, obviously draft and uh, uh, for, for, uh, for management mostly and uh, to set uh, eventually other marine protected areas in the deep sea. Because yes, now there are a lot of marine protected areas for shallow waters, but in the deep sea is still scan. Yes. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to make any other question, comments? Please, Christine. 
I would just like to add further to what uh, analogy I said that not only would the mapping be useful just to establish the marine protected areas from the aspect of cold water corals or other habitat forming species themselves, even when it comes to studying other species that might be around the more uh, benthic or demersal species, it would be very helpful when you have established and highly detailed mapping areas because one of the issues that we encountered in uh, my study was that it became quite tenacious to specify, to completely map out the details of where the habitats were being found. So uh, to kind of overcome that, we had to resort to generic um, descriptions, like habitats with cold water corals or habitats with sponges. Whereas if we could incorporate analogias work, it would have much more um, we could have much more insight to even correlate, for example, if it is one particular species of coral or sponge that is affecting distribution of other species. So it would enable to branch a number of studies together and we could get a much more holistic image of, of all the species mapping and distributions present. Yes, thank you. Are you... <coughs> Are you uh, taking any um, measurements of uh, environmental variables that can be used, for instance, in uh, modeling efforts to, to do some uh, habitat suitability mapping that can predict areas of your, the habitats that you find, but that can predict the uh, occurrence of these habitats uh, throughout the, the Mediterranean bas basin, for instance. So are you focused on describing the, the, the habitat or are, we, are you trying to go further and with your uh, limited knowledge, special limited knowledge, can you predict where you can find more of these habitats in the Mediterranean? So as to agree with what you clearly said, we are very much limited in the data that we could observe. One of the main problems encountered in our study was that we only had the footage to work off of. So the, the specific areas from where footage was collected it was highly dependent on whatever physical parameters could also be recorded from that area. And unfortunately, the project that was that collected the footage only recorded very limited parameters of the footage itself and uh, depth, which when studied in great detail, did not particularly describe or, or validate whatever distribution patterns we were observing. It is uh, very important for us actually to study further the same areas and um, measure much more physical parameters like uh, temperature, uh, nutrients, dissolved oxygen, so that we can much better correlate whatever patterns we are studying. It would be much more helpful to try and narrow down the limiting factors or controlling variables that are affecting the distribution. But I wouldn't go so far as maybe to say predict, explain more rather. Uh, but you can, uh, can, you, can you there are, there are uh, data sets available, uh, large data sets on, on several environmental variables that, that you can use uh, to overlap to your distributions. Um, unfortunately, especially in uh, my study, it was quite limited that there wasn't that much detailed into the area because um, the area itself that was the focus of our study, it was an escarpment where it, it's a little difficult to conduct measurements without fearing losing your gear, especially if it was with older technology that might not be as sufficient or robust. But it is definitely something that we need to consider. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I would like to ask Tal. Uh, uh, this, prom this program that you showed us where you did 23 cruises or something like that offshore Haifa, mm -hmm. uh, can you give us an idea of um, what was the benefit 
you really got and what are the key issues that uh, you were able to detect with such long-term observation and repeated observation that you would not do otherwise even using uh, remote sensing uh, or even other type of data? Well, so obviously the, the benefit of having a, a long time series is, uh, is enabling us to, to identify, first of all, long-term changes. This is actually a paper that we have published in, uh, for the, all, the, all of the um, shallower uh, water masses, so starting from the Levantin surface water until the intermediate water. Mm -hmm. And we were able to statistically identify uh, significant warming and salinification trends, and those are I guess only possible if you are able to maintain such long programs uh, uh, continuously. Um, of course, in order to get um, other signals uh, with uh, shorter frequencies or shorter uh, time periods, I would actually um, like to have uh, even a, a greater density or temporal density of, of um, of cruises, of uh, such obs observations, but those are, of course, limited by our uh, uh, finance. So. This is funded nationally? Yeah, uh, all, of this national data, all of this data is uh, funded nationally, both from the Ministry of Energy and the uh, Ministry of Environmental Protection. Uh, it's amazing because I think one of the key issues that we have now is this question of long time series. We do need these observations if we want to make predictions. And unfortunately, many times the, the, the timing of projects, they are too short so that we do this. So this really needs, and this is something that we try to involve governments at IOC, is that they need to look at long-term programs. Okay, this is absolutely essential in, in all areas because I think more and more we look at ocean science not only from a discipline, but we have to have an holistic view. So I don't know any other comments, questions to our great speakers. If not, I think we are on time to close. So I would like to thank all the speakers and I would like an applause to all of them for the great work they've done.